Hello everyone, uh, my name is Loretta heber Girardet. I'm the Chief of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction Technical Branch, which is responsible for risk knowledge, climate change, um, uh, monitoring, learning, various uh, different components. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce you to today's session, which is really hoping to ask the question and perhaps answer it, are we learning enough from um, early warning? If not, why not? And what can we do differently so that learning is really more embedded in the way that early warning is designed and implemented and created, you would say? So I was um, able to speak this morning and introduce the Early Warnings for All initiative. Um, for the global initiative, I co-lead pillar, pillar One, which is on risk knowledge. Vanessa Gray, my colleague here, leads Pillar Three and um, also co-lead the interpillar group. And one of the things that we really recognize is that in the midst of implementation and supporting countries, we don't really have time, or we're not taking the time perhaps, to ensure that we're drawing the lessons that we need and really learning. And this is where I think partnerships with the academic community, with the research centers, could really play an important role. But for this particular event, we did get uh, two members of my staff to pull together a zero budget film. <laughs> it's not really a film. It's um, essentially it's three interviews. Uh, we took three different case studies. Um, the first was on the Central European flooding in 2021, in which we have a German expert, Anna Gretikin, who's a professor at the Institute of Environmental Science and Geography at Potsdam University. Uh, to tell us what happened in the floods in Germany and where did the early warning systems not deliver the type of uh, early, um, I would say, warning and then action that was needed to save lives. The second um, interview is with Joel Meyer, who's the Senior Disaster Management Specialist from the Pacific Disaster Center in Hawaii, and is going to be talking about the campfire, so the wildfires that took place in uh, California. And the third uh, interview is from Irina Raffiana, who's the associate researcher at the German Institute of Development and Sustainability. At the time, she was uh, working in Indonesia. This is when I was the regional director of UNDR in Asia Pacific, where we undertook a forensics after the Sulawesi earthquake to understand a bit better what happened with the early warning systems there. So she's going to be talking about this. And so in these interviews, we've essentially asked them, what was the event? What happened in your view? Where were the, maybe, I don't want to use the word failures, but shortcomings perhaps in early warning. And how was the, the learning uh, incorporated or taken on board, or was it? Um, after this, we have a panel of experts and friends who are going to be giving their reactions to this, and then also talking, and I hope it'll be a conversation with all of you, about um, how can we improve learning, and uh, where should we concentrate our efforts moving forward. So, um, with no further ado, let's go ahead. It's about a 12, 13 minute film, but I hope you'll find it useful, and uh, yeah. It was actually well forecasted uh, from the meteorological side, um, but um, what was particularly challenging was that a lot of really small catchments, creeks, um, small rivers um, yeah, were affected and actually uh, showed a flooding that has not um, been witnessed in the, um, in the time period where we have continuous measurements. And it also showed inundation levels and areas um, that are not depicted or reflected in the official flood hazard maps. And for the for the very uh, severe forecasts, which were actually true and which were timely, 
um people responsible people like some mayors also said okay this is very high this can't be true uh so so that was also a situation uh where where trust uh, plays a role but also the anticipation that something severe really can happen uh, another difficulty is that um, the warning system in Germany is actually organized in a multi-governance uh, structure. So the meteorological forecasts are released by a national agency. This is the meteorological service or um, the German weather service. But the actual flood warning is then the responsibility of the states, uh, so a regional level. And that is differently organized and also their capabilities of flood forecasting, really forecasting water levels is a bit diverse. Um, but then, of course, there is the stage of dissemination. So the warnings have to reach the civil protection, the mayors um, that also have to reach the affected population. And um, here we see some uh, some challenges because um, there were so many warnings from different districts. Also, the media were a bit confused, uh, maybe what what really happens, and they uh, focused a lot on the meteorological warnings, not so much on the flooding situation. And the actual flooding developed quite fast, also appeared during the night, which is a difficult situation for the civil protection to rescue people, but also for the warning system to reach people and to alert them. Around half of the people stated that they were not warned at all. Um, and that, of course, shows also some weaknesses of the system that not everybody is reached uh, by a warning, although there are different channels. Uh, another one is that although um, yeah, then 70 percent of the people were reached by a warning, um, half of them stated, OK, I did not know what to do, uh, how to protect myself. Uh, so that means that they had difficulties in interpreting the warning um, and in really drawing conclusions how to behave adequately. Cell broadcast has now been established in all of Germany. It has been tested and 95% um, of the um, people surveyed reported that they um, uh, that they got a, a warning. Also, uh, the program of um, installing sirens again at the local level. Uh, so a lot of sirens were removed uh, in the 1990s after the Cold War ended. Um, and it is now been realized uh, more and more that that was a mistake. So um, there is a program now to to install the, the, the sirens uh, again. When it comes to to the flood forecasting and and warning capabilities of the states, um, and they also are now um, building up their capacity uh, to to enhance their capacity of doing flood forecasting modeling also for the smaller um, creeks and, and smaller catchments. And they also improved their linkage to the civil protection to, um, to overcome these barriers and the sinking in si silos. Uh, and they also decided to communicate uncertainties better. Oh. common learning protocol, or what was then used incident command uh, reporting there in the state of California is a big part of what the state of California does. Alerts are cap alerts, and of course, alerts will go out uh, via radio. They'll often be, again, via kind of wide area alerting. Uh, you can get alerts on TV. You can also get cell phone alerts. Um, those are very useful. And of course, the state of California was an early adopter for those. So the chain of events was, of course, Many residents knew that these winds were coming, of course, the first responders. The chain through incident command is, of course, your local sheriff and police, your local fire. Cal Fire, of course, was, of course, standing by. They often pre-position, uh, whether it's in Southern California or Northern. If there's a red flag event or a Santa Ana event, you'll be pre-positioning assets, meaning fire trucks. The wind, of course, will hamper uh, aerial assets. But, of course, those, those warnings would have gone out and did go out. 
But a lot of what hampered Paradise, and I'll speak more to it, was the logistics, number one. It's a beautiful place covered by trees. A lot of places did not have what we call defensible space, which is often 200 feet, uh, 70 meters or 50 meters where there are no trees next to structures. And then, of course, uh, like all events, if they happen at night, uh, and as we know, kind of the fog of a war of responses. Um, evacuations and preemptive evacuations, uh, better, much like Katrina, better locating uh, of assets to evacuate, more school buses. We learned that we were just getting into phone-specific alerting, but in big population areas or even isolated areas, staging alerts, even 15 minutes apart by census tracts or even blocks, allows people to leave in an orderly fashion. Uh, sending an alert to an entire community at once can instantly clog. Um, it's a bit of the trickle issue. You you can clog up the entire road system. And in this case, there were only three coming out of Paradise. Um, those with mobility challenges, um, giving alerting in different languages would have been key. Vendor partners like Google and, and Facebook and Data for Good, you can get alerts to people in their languages in a timely manner. I think those would have helped. Making sure that those that may have disabilities that cannot hear alerts get alerts in a different way. So I think inclusive alerts, early alerts were learned, but of course the fires, we are sadly in an age of climate change. These fires uh, are always becoming million acre fires, things that never happened before. We used to have a fire season. Usually the fire season is done by October, by Halloween. To have paradise incinerated in uh, the late part of November was also a challenge because we were not used to that. I'll always say the R word, which is relationships. You know, we, uh, I had had a relationship with California because I'd worked there and been raised there. So building that trust, exercising, I think some of the gaps, you don't know what the gaps are until you do exercises. Preparedness, lessons learned and exercising on that. And of course, community building as well. And never, never doubt the power of the Ohana, again, from Fiji to Hawaii to have communities do alerting that are culturally sensitive, especially to First Nations and Indigenous people. The event uh, originated from actually um, a, a foreshock that happened in 3 p.m. So that itself already created a very vulnerable context at the local level in both uh, Palu City and also Dongala. Um, and then the uh, earthquake event itself, the main shock occurred at 6 p.m. So the communities actually had evacuated, self-evacuated themselves to the hill, particularly those in the district areas. But when they received the information from the authorized organization, which is BMKG, that that earthquake is, is non-tsunamigenic, people started to move back to their villages. And then the main shock happened at 6 p.m., and the wave came in really, really fast, and uh, it was unprecedented. And the warning did not came in uh, because of the um, damage in infrastructure, uh, mostly because of the foreshock. So on the other hand, there were also uh, different um, initiative, like uh, self-evacuation occurred, but these are more in the uh, district area rather than in the urban area. And in this sense itself, it gives a, a quite interesting um, argument how significantly differentiated uh, these responses in these different uh, coastal settings, urban and rural. One of the biggest challenge is to look at this event as a, a complex and cascading event entangled with complex social geological history as well. And uh, often, um, we treat events only deterministically, while on the other hand, Palu case um, demonstrate uh, a very diverse hazard sources and our understanding about the earth dynamic is continuously changing and science is also continuously learning. And that should, tsunami should no longer be defined merely as a wave triggered by underwater um, earthquakes emerging from major fault lines. Um, there are also diverse risk knowledge that are shaped by different perceptions. 
um, local knowledge preserved in rural area, but not likely in the urban area because of the mass movement and also mobilization. And hazard and risk information are also treated uh, deterministically. So tsunami warning system preliminarily is defined deterministically as a complete and finished product, as an opposed to continuously becoming. And this is what became a huge challenge, I think, for every one of us here to redefine what tsunami warning system is and how we live with this continuously growing technologies and at the same time understanding of the uh, geological setting and also the social uh, dynamics. What is learned and incorporated to the national um, Indonesian tsunami warning system in uh, is of course changes in SOP and multimodal warning dissemination with a stronger and wider use of social media, Twitter, Facebook, and WhatsApp, more encouragement for self-evacuation capacities, and I think more humble uh, positioning of what tsunami warning system can provide and serve. It could provide um, a preliminary information way before the wave arrived, but it could also be an important information once the wave already arrived and places the tsunami information right after it, which means communities can still stay in the safe ground until all of the waves are saturated and, and all are clear, and then we can do the next step with a response. One important point here is to really revisit critically about what we mean by a successful warning system service and what are the key performance indicator in the sense. Um, it should not only address the time or the timely manner of the warning system. Uh, the point would be uh, the importance of explicitly state the successful of the warning system is the number of lives saved. And this means that the responsibility does not only necessarily rely uh, on the shoulders of the National Tsunami Warning Center, but on the all of different elements, all of the different levels, all of different uh, communities and social groups bear these responsibilities. And that helps us to redefine what warning system is. want to start off today's session <coughs> by listening from people who have been really um, involved in some disasters and have studied and understood or trying to apply some of the lessons um, from these specific events. We had other events as well, Malawi recently, Cyclone Freddy, but in the interest of time we just focus on these three. So I'd like to now invite the panelists to join uh, me at this table. Okay, so what we wanted to do was just to have a bit of a conversation, and by this I mean do feel free to, to join in and share your views and perspectives. What I'd like to do is to start off just going around the table and asking the colleagues here um, if you could share some of your reflections, like what struck you, if anything, on these um, uh, testimonies that you've heard from in the video. And I'm going to start with uh, Ben Webster, who's on our left. He's the head of the REAP Secretariat, has worked in the humanitarian sector for quite a bit of time since 2003 and with the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement with a broad range of experience in Africa, Asia, Middle East and Caribbean and also working very closely on the Early Warnings for All initiative. So Ben, REAP is an organization that is very much at the forefront of collecting, learning about early warning. Um, what comments could you share with us? Or what reflections based on the three case studies you've heard here? So let's start with you. Thanks, Laurie. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Um, I'm very interested to hear all of your learning and perspectives as well. I think a couple of items that stood out for me. Um, one is this sense of unprecedented disasters starting to happen. So Joel was referring to millions of uh, hectares or acres being affected in wildfires these days. Um, in Sulawesi, it was referred to as unprecedented, you know, the speed at which the, the waves approached and so on. Um, the I think with Germany as well, um, you know, we're starting to see what the new normal might be in terms of constantly elevating in terms of the, the hazards that we're facing um, and therefore the response and, and what we 
yeah might need to deal with in the future so i think that's one thing you know we can't just learn from the past and be ready for what we've experienced previously we need to be thinking ahead in terms of decades and what kind of uplift we might need um, for preparedness looking forward um, secondly i mean we always hear similar issues coming through from all these different contexts it doesn't matter um, if it's germany or malawi or wherever it's about trust both in the information but also the relationships between key stakeholders um, trust in the messages you receive trust in the authorities or whoever you're receiving the message from clear roles and responsibilities you know in some respects th there's nothing new coming out in all of the things that we're learning um, so really from a partnership perspective starting to think through well well how do we learn then like what what are the broader trends what are the things that we need to be doing um, and I guess in my experience it's been down to one people you know do we retain and develop and harness the people who learn from one experience to another and that applies at the local level at the national level at the regional level at the international level um, but we rely on people basically secondly the processes and the systems and the structure you know with all of this expertise that we have around the world um, it can sometimes feel overwhelming. So how can we bring in systems and structures and processes that help us to um, curate this learning and identify well, what do we need to do next? But then thirdly, it's the culture. And I'll come on to this um, a bit later, if that's okay, around trust. How can we actually facilitate learning? How can we encourage learning and create a culture where that's encouraged? Um, those are initial reflections. Thanks very much, Ben. And now I'd like to go to Mark Harvey, who's the founder and CEO of Resurgence, a global social enterprise that supports urban climate risk reduction and resilience. Um, Mark, I noted that in the case of Sulawesi, um, there was this comment that when it came to local understanding, there was a difference in urban and rural settings on how populations responded to the warnings. I don't know if you have any reflections on that or any other um, of the uh, interviews that you heard. Thank you. It's great to be here today. Um, and yes, I did note that comment. Um, and two things struck me. One was the reference to local risk knowledge being retained in rural areas, whereas it was being lost um, in urban contexts. And, and, and that, that made me reflect on the fact that I think the, the growing urban settlements often are being populated by communities coming off the land because the land is is failing. They may be bringing with them different um, language backgrounds, different um, uh, ethnicities, and actually uh, targeting in, an, in a collaborative, inclusive way through correctly packaged information is absolutely key. So what comes across to me is not just the challenge of managing, I think it was referred to as cascading compound risk, but actually uh, how do we actually um, uh, prepare communities, and preparedness was a big issue as well, uh, lack of preparedness around evacuation routes, uh, lack of knowledge of what to do with flood warnings across the cases. But actually, uh, in, this, uh, in this new era of demographic flux and, and urbanization, yeah, how do we actually co-create with communities information that they trust, uh, ways of preparing them so that that critical level, the local level, works um, as well and as effectively as it can because all the impact is ultimately it's local. And I think we get a little bit caught up uh, in the national uh, and don't look closely at the local enough. Excellent. I hope we'll have some time later today to talk more about that. I'd now like to go to Zoe Hamilton, who works as a research and policy manager at GSMA. Uh, you may want to explain a bit more what GSMA does. I'm not sure if all the colleagues in the room are aware. But you are a dedicated research and humanitarian advocate who's working very much on leveraging mobile technology to accelerate the delivery of humanitarian aid and uh, early warning messaging as well. So in the examples, we certainly heard a lot about uh, communication. 
Um, I was surprised even to hear that in Germany, people received the message but didn't quite know what to do with this. And that's something that we've heard in many different contexts as well. But any reflections from a perspective of somebody who's specialist in the mobile uh, technology community? <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much, and thanks for having me. Um, I, I work at the GSMA, which is the Global Trade Association for Mobile Network Operators. Uh, so, so that's our, our primary um, audience and, and members. But I work more specifically in the foundation, where we look at how mobile technology can be leveraged for social impact. And in the Mobile for Humanitarian Innovation team, we've really been looking at humanitarian preparedness and the role that technology can play for a number of years now. Um, and, and with mobile networks covering 95% of the world and, and 5.4 billion unique mobile subscribers, there really is an opportunity for early warning systems to be leveraging mobile technology and for messages to be disseminated through these channels as, as we mentioned. And one of the things I was reflecting on when listening to this, this video was the limits of technology, of, of what can we do with mobile technology and, and what do we need around that technology to make the systems function well. So I think a, a few things that, that resonated with me were the importance of, of geo-targeting and geofencing alerts to make sure that the right people are getting uh, the information that they need um, and not, not too many so that you clog uh, exit routes, as as uh, was was mentioned, and I think that there is exciting new technology that's helping us geofence alerts and, and target more effectively, um, reaching people. The the reach of mobile networks makes it an an effective channel, but of course not the only effective channel. And other technologies, satellites, sirens, IoT sensors can can really help to to better understand and disseminate risk um, knowledge. Um, and then language and customization, which was also mentioned, making sure that people are receiving alerts in their local language and um, targeted uh, to their local needs. People with disabilities were mentioned. And, and technology can allow those messages to be better targeted. At the same time, a few things were mentioned that technology can't do and that we need to think about alongside. Uh, the systems around it, trust, as, as, as Ben already highlighted in, in the source, making sure that people, uh, there's enough community sensitization happening so that people know what to do when they do receive an alert. Um, so community awareness is definitely something that we've seen come up in our work. And inclusion, which has come up a few times as well. Um, the importance of, of making sure that systems are designed with the most marginalized in mind and with those communities co-creating them, as, uh, as Mark said. Um, and, and to make sure that everyone can reach them. So maybe I'll stop there, but I can delve more into those themes later. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I was uh, noticing the comment about Germany that they had removed the sirens after the Cold War and not going to reestate them, whereas in Indonesia, they had relied on the sirens that didn't work and therefore we will now look for other types of means of dissemination. So it's very context specific. Let me now go to Dorothy Heinrich, who is a technical advisor for the IFRC's Climate Center's climate science team. Some reflections from you, please. Sure, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I was reflecting on what Ben was saying and watching the video and the power of learning after disasters happen. And I think there is a tremendous amount of opportunity that it opens up, sadly, especially after these big events. Um, when we tell the stories and we try to remember and we try to reflect on what these gaps are, what happened, and then we try to do better for next time. And I think this emphasis on memory and this emphasis on storytelling becomes really important. And I think it fits well into this theme of today in terms of how do we actually learn the lessons that we're identifying and what do we do with this. So within the Red Cross Red Crescent, we work on this very much. You know, there's a lot of work that UNDR has done as well on on this question of after action reviews, properly reviewing what happens after these disasters. And I think that's really important. Another theme I think that came up, and I don't know, someone might have mentioned as well, this question of, um, of unprecedented events. And so we know relatively what to do for events that we have a lot of experience with. We know these are events that we've either had direct experience with or that countries or regions have known well. And the, often there are systems for these types of things. What happens, though, when events happen, 
that we've had absolutely no way of imagining what they would have looked like. And how do we enhance that type of memory and that type of risk perception? Um, and that plays a lot into, I think, this question of trust. Are you going to trust a warning if it tells you that something happened, is going to happen, that you've never experienced before, you've never seen, and you cannot even imagine what it would look like? When we have a tendency to presume that people will know what to do. Um, and I think that quite question becomes really tricky. I mean, CAP alerting systems that Josh mentioned in the, um, I'm sorry, Joel mentioned in the video, is a really well-established system that has a, a way of talking about events and has um, and puts content in it. Um, but what happens when we're talking about events that people don't know and they receive warnings for things that they've never seen before? So I think that's probably a really big one as well. Thanks. Excellent. Yes, and indeed, climate change is bringing events to countries that they haven't experienced or at a time or in a place that they've never experienced it. So really excellent points. I'm now turning to John Stone, who's an expert in the field of climate and disaster resilience. He's currently the coordinator of the UNDRR WMO Center of Excellence uh, for Climate and Disaster Resilience. So, John, over to you. Thanks. And... Um just to say, I'm glad Ben is wearing a different colour blazer to me, otherwise it looks like there's a mirror image on the, on the stage. Um, so actually, I think Ben and Dorothy both said what I was wanting to say, which is really, you know, how do we learn from things that haven't happened yet, was what I was originally going to say. But I think Dorothy said it better. How do we learn from things that we haven't imagined yet? Because um, some of these events that we're seeing around the world, you saw just this week, you know, the flooding in Hong Kong, the flooding in Greece, um, even the earthquake in Morocco, these are events which, yes, we know they're sort of possible, but we maybe haven't seen them yet. And so we, we keep using this word unprecedented. Um, I think that maybe just also means we haven't imagined it yet. So how do we collectively start learning from things that haven't yet happened? Because clearly that's what we're needing to do if we're wanting to manage risk properly. And I, I see a few colleagues in the audience here from my former kind of uh, employer of the UK Cabinet Office who do lots of work on risk management. I see some other faces who have worked um, kind of on volcano science here and I think there's an awful lot to borrow across the different sectors from others who are really thinking on these longer time scales of the kind of those kind of like less likely events. So um, yeah how are we learning from things that we haven't yet imagined? How can we imagine them a bit better? Great and now I'll turn to the the head of the Pillar 3 of the Early Warnings for All initiative, which is very much focused on communication. Um, a lot of comments in the film were about how communication is taking place. So what lessons for Pillar 3 moving ahead? Thank you very much. And first time I'm the tallest on a panel. Um, yes, I think, I mean, you know, all the very important things I think that were said again, you know, things that have never happened before. So we need to improve the risk knowledge that we have, we need to review you know, what we know and how to be better prepared. Also, I think what came up quite a bit is these standard operating procedures, which is linked to the governance, who's in charge, who sends messages, um, who is allowed to decide when something needs to be sent out. I think that's really very important, and that's also something when we go to the countries, very often um, there is, um, it is difficult for the countries to, um, you know, to put, set this up. And this is something I think where we really need to emphasize the, the, the government um, issue. Of course, in terms of their technology, we emphasize also as part of our Pillar 3 work that um, today, with the growth in information and communication technologies, there's many more ways to reach people at risk. Um, a lot of people use the internet, we have social media, um, radio, TV, of course, but then, as Zoe also mentioned, of course, mobile phones, and I think here just important, um, it came up a little bit in the, in the German discussion, um, we're not talking about apps, because apps as public warning systems uh, usually do not work, we're talking about cell broadcasts, you mentioned it actually, because before this disaster in Germany, they did not have cell broadcast. Uh, they have now implemented it, which is a technology where people receive alerts on their mobile phones. It's geolocated. It goes only to the people at um, in risk in at risk areas. It is not a fancy or new technology. It's pretty well established. There are many cases, uh, many countries that have set it up. So this is something we really promote, um, of course, as part of the multi-channel approach. But we really approach this um, cell broadcast technology to make sure that people um, get reached on their mobile phones. 
um, again, especially in the context of the number of people who own mobile phones, the large majority of people today in the world, even in um, developing countries, own a mobile phone. So it's really a very, very powerful tool um, to be reached. And um, yeah, finally, again, I think you said it nicely, so I think you know what technology can done and can do and what it cannot do, it's really important. Um, it's the people uh, that, that make the, the whole system work. I think that's important. Great, thank you very much. So we've heard about governance, trust, partnerships, relationships, communication, the hazards which are shifting now thanks to climate change in terms of their scale, their frequency, their intensity. Are there any other reflections that any of the members of the audience would like to share before we dig into a bit more of a panel discussion? Anything that struck any of you that you'd like to share with the room? Yes, I don't, does, is, can somebody help with the microphone, please? And please, please feel free to introduce yourself. Yep. This gentleman here. My name is Bob Goldhammer. I'm with the International Association of Emergency Managers. And listening to you all talking about the lessons learned, we've been using that phrase for a couple of decades. And actually, we started changing it around. We were calling it lessons not learned. <laughs> because the events, although they're increasing in frequency and they're increasing in intensity, and they're increasing in geographical location, there's still the same type of events, and we don't seem to always be able to capture the things that went wrong and fix them for the future. So that's my observation based on the three presentations that were in the video and also the comments that were made, and I'm hoping that we can do a better job of actually learning the lessons that we haven't been. Let's hear from the room. Yeah, please. Thank you for that comment. Um, thanks, uh, Andrew Tapper. I'm an Australian meteorologist. Um, just a reflection on the word unprecedented. We had a, an unprecedented summer a, a couple of summers ago, and the word got rapidly stale. But I was reflecting that um, historically, every disaster is unprecedented for the people who experienced it. And even if they've seen the flood or the cyclone or the eruption before, it's usually happened in a different way and they have to tr translate what happened then to, to a different context. Um, but possibly now we have the opportunity through communication um, of helping all the world understand what's happening to all the rest of the world if that's not too over overwhelming. We've actually got more power to connect with people than at any time in history. So maybe we can sort of change from un unprecedented to it happens, hasn't happened to me yet, but I already understand it. That's a great reflection. It hasn't happened to me yet. Yeah, <laughs> good. OK, there were some more hands up, I think. Yes, please. Um, my name is Mary Murkita. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow with the UCL Warning Research Center. Um, and very interesting um, and stimulating uh, comments by uh, the panelists. I think um, two things struck me uh, from the interviews that I would love to hear more about from um, experts uh, in the panel as well in the room. Um, one was that the hazards or events happened at night. And how are we um, improving our systems, our communications? You mentioned um, cell phones. Uh, people don't, you know, when they're sleeping, they're not gonna, unless I put my phone on silent. <laughs> I don't know, um, how do we reach people at night, especially since two of the um, incidences that they mentioned happened at night. Uh, the other thing I think that we should reflect upon collectively is also damage to warning systems or infrastructure, especially in cascading events, when we think about compounding and cascading events, and you're relying upon, um, in some cases, in the ideal case, you have the structures in place, but then, um, you know, they, they're damaged or they're in disrepair, how do you deal with that? So thank you for your thoughts. 
These are great questions. Well, why don't we go ahead and take those, and then if colleagues have other questions they'd like to ask, we can go back to that. So hazards that happen at night, and with cell broadcasting, how is this uh, dealt with? Maybe I'll start with Vanessa and see if other colleagues would like to answer. So with cell broadcast, there's a, it's like a very distinct beep that is sent, um, and that wakes up people at night. Um, so it is, uh, it is a technology that works. It's even, and this is why it's also interesting for many developing countries, um, even if you don't have a subscription, it beeps on your phone. Uh, so that makes it a very powerful um, technology. It has limitations because it's, for example, not two-way. It's just you receive the message, but you can't answer. It's not like an SMS or an app, but it is a very po powerful message, I would say, for um, for emergencies where people have to be woken up, have to, you know, be alerted um, immediately. And then, uh, you mentioned, the, um, of course, one thing that can happen is mobile networks go down. Um, fires, fiber optic cables can be burned. Um, towers, mobile towers can go down. So um, it's, that's why we promote a multi-channel approach and it's critical to have resilient infrastructure backup system. One very exciting thing that's happening at the moment is in terms of satellite um, systems, there is um, research going on and projects being developed where uh, messages, alerts are being sent over satellite systems but reached, you, they're sent to your mobile phone and they're independent of mobile networks, so they don't have you know, that, that issue. Um, they're really good backup systems. The European Union is um, working on one. And so this is something for sure over the next few years we will see coming. And also, of course, these satellite systems will be available in any area. So um, there's a lot happening there. Any, any other colleagues like to answer this question? Then we'll move on to when the technology yeah. um, this does seem to apply particularly to rapid onset events like earthquakes, but it, it does also apply to uh, examples where communities are swept away by floods in the night. And, and it seems that um, we, we want to enable a general state of preparedness you know, over a, a, on a 24-hour basis and, and understand how communities consume information you know, at different times of the day. So, and who is who is around and alert? So, I think during a, a particular period of floods and being aware of community that there's been some new construction work, which might mean that water build up could actually sweep away individual lodgings, is part of it. But also having done an analysis of, okay, who's listening at what time to which radio or TV programs? So, I think it's 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 sort of multi-channel as was referred to, and I think we, we want a sort of a general state of, of awareness and particularly preparedness during periods of heavy rains, for instance. I think there are particular issues with earthquakes, obviously. Yeah. Any other colleagues? I could, could I ask a question? Sure, you could. Yeah, in, in terms of damaged infrastructure as well, it's something that the GSMA has worked with quite extensively with mobile network operators to make sure that they are prepared, um, especially in areas where they're going to be hit seasonally, um, to, to pre-position key equipment for key sites to, to make sure that they've mapped with governments, um, for example, key areas that, that need priority connectivity like hospitals. Um, to, to make sure that fuel um, is able to reach generators to make sure that that cell sites can get back quickly, understanding that most sectors depend on connectivity in order to have an effective response. Um, yeah, thanks. Great. Okay, let's go ahead with the panel discussion. I'm going to go back to you, Ben. REAP promotes, obviously, uh, very inclusive and coordinated early warning systems, bringing in a broad range of stakeholders. So let's go to the gentleman's question. What can we do to do a better job of learning? And how do we bring in this broad range of stakeholders who have their experiences that can be brought to bear? It's not just the government, it's the civil society, it's NGOs, it's a broad range. So what can we do differently now to really ensure that collective learning is brought into the design and the delivery of early warning systems? Thanks, Laurie, for the question. Um, maybe to start off by coming back to the point from Mr. Goldhammer about it's not lessons learned, it's lessons identified, as Dorothy mentioned earlier, or lessons not learned. Um, 
I think this is really important. So first of all, we need to be honest. We need to be real about what isn't working well. We're not in a world that really encourages us to um, share failings and share challenges. So I think that's absolutely number one. We like to call it lessons learned to tick the box and move on, um, when in reality, maybe it would be more effective if, um, if we do actually get a bit more honest with ourselves and with everybody else. Um, I would give the Climate Centre a big shout on this front because I think people like um, Pablo and Erin for years have been offering opportunities to be a bit more um, real and, and honest uh, with our learning on this front. Secondly, we heard time and again about trust. Um, so as a partnership, this is one thing we're aiming to do is build trust between different types of partner across different communities. Um, and I remember a few years ago uh, reading something called the trust equation. And my initial reaction was, what a load of nonsense. Um, you know, that kind of management nonsense talk. But the more I reflected on it, um, actually, the more it resonated. So, um, you know, we hear a lot, time and time again, I can't tell you the number of times over the last few years I've heard about reducing silos. We have to reduce silos. Uh, but the implications of that mean we actually have to give away some of the control and collaborate with people that we wouldn't normally collaborate with. So what is the trust equation? Well, trust is equal to, apparently, credibility plus reliability plus empathy or intimacy. So that's, you know, do you have the reputation? Do you deliver what you say you will? And reliably, on a, on a constant basis, time and time again, you can be relied upon to be um, trustworthy. And also empathy, you know, can people understand where you're coming from? Do they... Uh, um, trust your story and what you have to offer all of that builds trust and all of that is divided by self-interest so as soon as it turns into competition well we're going to withhold this information you know that person doesn't trust then the whole equation starts to break down so number two in terms of that trust how can we reduce our own interests see the world from different perspectives um, I think that will go a long way Thirdly, um, how can we consolidate the existing research and evidence? We've said, you know, there's so much out there, um, but it is dissipated. It's in so many different nooks and crannies. Like, how can we actually start pooling it? Um, but not only pooling it, like, it's good to know that it's out there, but who's going to curate it? Who's going to say, OK, well, we know this much, but there's a gap here. There's a gap there. And then harness, you know, that academia um, to really push further into those areas where there are gaps and so on. So that for me is where we need collective effort um, to start compiling, curating and identifying gaps going forward. Those would be initial suggestions. Thank you. And I, I'm going to go now uh, back to Mark and say, well, specifically, how can we ensure that the type of learning that's being carried out by NGOs and civil society organizations who are very close to the ground um, are really feeding back into the development and uh, early warning systems? Is that happening or is that a gap that we need to focus more on? Thank you, Laurie. Um, well, I would say it's not happening enough. And, and I think that actually... Yeah, we need, you, you, those organizations aren't really qualified as learning partners unless they're part of the process of early warning system design in the first place. And I think there are three or four areas where the kind of community-based partner that we work with, for instance, affiliates of Slum Dwellers International, they're small organizations, often in large cities, but, you know, what roles can they play in, in actually um, supporting uh, governments, national and regional, and local to design early warning systems. Well, one, I think, in research in a particularly uh, under-respected data category. So there's a primacy of risk data, of hazard um, exposure and vulnerability data. That is really important. But what about the data on um, access and reach of um, forecasts and early warnings and climate risk information what about the data on um, uh, trust in that information, on channel use and preferences, on actually how that is understood and acted on, and how it may or may not um, save property, um, reduce health impacts, and even save lives? So all those things 
um, are actually uh, within the grasp of community organizations to research using research methodologies that have been developed by organizations like PBC Media Action and ourselves. This you could call it market research, but it's a desperately um, under-cherished data category in this sector. So research is one area, because that will help inform design. And then actually bringing them to the table uh, to actually co-design and input into the warnings, um, the language, the zoning, uh, at times the, the icons, so that they're intelligible to different <coughs> users, whether they are urban dwellers, fishermen, uh, whether they are farmers or pastoralists. So co-design of forecasts and early warnings to as localized degree as possible. Then actually thresholds and understanding that what may never reach the, the threshold of an official national early warning could actually have quite a significant impact. Um, it might just be six hours of moderate rain uh, across an, in, uh, an urban uh, informal settlement that doesn't have any tarmac. That could cause flooding. Or it could be a, a prolonged hot spell that doesn't become reach the status of a national heat wave. What you need, therefore, is a system that these community organizations can do, which is to add advisories, which are not official, but they're localized. And then I think awareness raising uh, and preparedness, because I think these organizations can generate awareness and can work on preparedness plans with organizations like the Red Cross. And then finally, feedback and accountability. They can provide feedback on what, what was understood, what, what, what messages were and were not received, what was acted upon and what wasn't, and also demand at times better service themselves, right? So uh, those are four areas where I think those, you know, those small community-based organizations, if they're put in the right framework and they're, they're sort of called upon to act in those four areas, can really make a difference to the design of, of early warning systems. Excellent. And, and that goes very much with the fact that what we're witnessing is an increase in low-intensity, high-frequency events, where they do not reach the national level but require some management at a local level to avoid uh, losses and damages. So the idea that these NGOs and civil society organizations can play in a role in issuing these advisories really resonates. Before I go on with the panel, I am going to call on Lisa Robinson, if you don't mind, Lisa, from BBC Media Action, because you, you raised some really great points about really understanding. Oops. Battery may be going out. Um, understanding uh, the audience, I guess you would call it, uh, better, their preferences for communication. And Lisa, I'm wondering, could I just ask you to share a few words? Because I know you are a member of Pillar 3, BBC Media Action. You're doing some of the research that Mark refers to. Would you mind just updating us briefly? Yeah, do I need the microphone? Yeah, she's right behind you, yeah. Thanks, fantastic panel. Thank you, everyone. And. I think what I'm thinking about is one step beyond the technology. We focused a lot on reach, and what Mark has just been talking about is a really helpful segue to think about how do we make early warning systems really interactive. And so, uh, aside from the, I used the term earlier in the session, aside from the spray and pray approach, we really need to be thinking carefully about how do we have a genuine dialogue with people who are at risk, not just at the moment of releasing the early warnings, but long before, so that when it's time to, to launch that early warning system, people really understand it. And also, we all, people and, and people who are organizing the, the system, have an idea of what kinds of actions we want people to take. Because I think a lot of times we're assuming that there's a correct action, when in fact life is very complicated and it's much more about informed decision making for people on the other end. So how we measure the, the success or the impact of early warning systems also comes down to the ideal scenario that we'd like to see um, happen as a result of the, of the system. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much for that impromptu uh, intervention, but I think that really added a lot of value. So let me now go to Zoe, back to Zoe. Um, and we know that uh, technology, as we've just heard, has a role, has an important role, not as a standalone, but combined with indigenous knowledge and other 
forms of community engagement, but nonetheless, what are we learning about the role of technology in early warning systems, and what are some of the key lessons um, that, our, that GSMA can share with us? Yeah, thanks so much, and I, I think this, the conversation has, has led perfectly, because what I, what I wanted to talk about was the importance of research and understanding local context when leveraging technology, because we know that mobile penetration rates, who has access to phones, when, how, what people use it for, what are the barriers to access, varies immensely from place to place. And that's one of the things that, that our team has, has focused on quite a lot in our research is, is understanding local digital landscapes and designing with local communities before ever relying upon mobile technologies. Um, the risk, I think, when working in technology is that, that new, shiny innovations come about and we get excited and we use them, but we, we don't understand enough what people themselves are already using because that's going to be the most effective way of alerting them or providing life-saving information is, is meeting people where they are. So um, before starting in, in any context, understanding what is the mobile penetration rate, what types of phones do people have, who within the household has access to a phone and who doesn't, um, in, in our work, for example, we, we see that sometimes women or girls or people with disabilities um, or older people can, can be excluded um, from access to mobile technology. What channels are people using? What language are they communicating in? Um, what levels of literacy or digital literacy? Um, and are there structural barriers like lack of infrastructure, lack of access to charging? Um, and what's the regulatory environment like? Sometimes displaced people don't have access to SIM cards in their own name due to KYC requirements. And, and that all feeds into the way that the system and the information ecosystem is, is designed in terms of format, channels, languages, et cetera. Um, and I, I think that it, it also applies to actionability of messages, which has come up a few times as well. Do people have what they need to, to know what to do with that information um, once, once, once they have it? Um, so I, I think that that's, that's the core lesson um, that, that our team has, has really learned is designing for those localized barriers, um, understanding if digital literacy is the main barrier, building in digital literacy programs as, as the start of that. You cannot use mobile technology as your main channel for disseminating early warnings if people don't know how to use a phone or if they don't speak the majority language of the country. So designing with marginalized communities especially and keeping those those communities at the center of the process is absolutely key to have an inclusive early warning system. Our team is actually conducting research um, over the next year with the IFRC and the South African Red Cross um, in three different locations in South Africa working specifically with, with different marginalized communities to understand the barriers and hopefully provide some lessons on, on how, to, how to do that better as a, as a global community. Thanks. Great. Uh, thanks so much for that. And I'd now like to go back to Dorothy uh, from the Red Cross, Red Crescent Climate Center. So we know that the Federation is obviously a pioneer in early and anticipatory action, which is the all-important pillar four, um, where the action occurs. Now, what strategies are you finding that are proving effective in ensuring that lessons learned from past disasters are incorporated into future planning for anticipatory action and preparedness efforts. Thanks so much. I, um, I actually did want to reflect back on this question of anticipatory action because I think we missed it a little bit in the video and there's some really interesting lessons even just from those couple minutes. I think the, the, focus, from, the focus on early warning, early action as a, as a component is extremely important. And the early action part comes at the end, um, but but it is, it is really the aim of the early warning. The whole point is that we want people to take... We want people, we want... Sorry. We want people, we want institutions. Is this breaking? Sometimes. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we want people to take anticipatory action. We want people to take actions to protect themselves. Can you hear me? <laughs> to protect themselves, to protect their families, their communities. We want institutions to take anticipatory action based on... Um, jurisdiction based on mandates. 
And, and this focus on the action side, I think sometimes is, is, always, is often put a little bit to the side. We, we kind of presume that we know what, is it, what it is that we need to do. And I think uh, Lisa had a really good point earlier saying, you know, assuming that we know what the right action is can be a problem because we don't then look at it specifically. And so we've been doing a lot of work um, on anticipatory action specifically, trying to figure out what is it that would be um, effective anticipatory actions to take. And there's a lot of lessons. Uh, the Anticipation Hub is a really good resource for things uh, like this specifically in terms of documentation, case studies, different programs that exist. Um, so if you are interested in kind of looking more into the action side, um, there's a lot of work there and, and a lot of collaborations with many of you in the room that I see right now. <laughs> Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's probably a really big thing. And the more that we do it, and the more that we document, and the more that we talk about it, the better, um, better the systems become. And I think that's probably one of the biggest side of things, is to look, really look at the actions that people want to be taking, and how do we then enable that with our systems. And then just lastly, I think, I think the, did you, yeah. I think the Paradise Fire is a really interesting one, because the, the video, the one in California, it was, up until a few weeks ago, was the deadliest wildfire um, in the U.S. I think it was 85 people that died in the Paradise Fires. The Maui ones that just occurred uh, in Hawaii had over 115... Hello, can you hear me? Ah. Uh, had over 115 um, casualties, which is extremely sad. And I think one of the big stories... In the Paradise Wildfire... <laughs> Uh, from the Paradise stories is that you know the warnings were there and the question of evacuations was extremely important. So all these people got a lot of information and all the information at once had a very specific effect of a lot of people wanting to evacuate. Small community really difficult to um, to evacuate out of small communities up in um, in the high desert in California. And so how do you then create warnings that make sure that you don't have everyone evacuated at the same time and that creates situations that are really dangerous. Yeah. And so there's a lot of lessons, I think, that we can get from disaster risk management. This is, a, this is not new stuff. You know, this is old things like table talk simulations. Um, after action reviews are extremely important. Those types of tools that we already do, and just finding a way to do them even before the disasters actually happen, making sure that we're prepared for those as well. <laughs> Sorry that technology is failing us a bit today, but um, OK. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to pivot a little bit right now. and recognize that many of the countries that are really um, suffering from a lack of effective early warning systems are also countries that have been experiencing conflict or post-conflict settings. And one of the issues that we're grappling with as part of the Early Warnings for All initiative is how do we ensure that we promote early warning systems that are really um, based on different types of contexts. So I'd now like to talk, uh, go over to John um, to speak to us a little bit about the work that the Center of Excellence is undertaking now to launch a handbook on scaling up early warnings and action in fragile contexts. So, John, good luck with the microphone, and over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Laurie. Um, so, I think, I think we have a huge problem at the moment globally, um, partly driven by the fact that tall white experts from the global north, um, you know, I'm, I'm tall white straight, male, wealthy, <laughs> with several degrees, right? And the definition of privileged and probably therefore very much not vulnerable to many of the hazards that we're talking about. So just putting that on the table. We have this big issue where there's a lot of us, and most of us probably in this room are also included. It's great. We also have some voices from the field. And there are obviously good climate reasons why we don't fly lots of people in. But all of that said, our mindset is very much that if you knew what I knew, you might do what I do. Or if only we could warn you in time, then you might act. And so we're actually doing this piece of work at the moment, looking at fragile, conflict, violence affected places, because not just because that's where a lot of the world's most vulnerable people are, a lot of people who aren't served by warnings, a lot of people who don't have access to information or basic services, but also because I think it's going to be a really good reality check for us. So I think there's a real danger at the moment that most of us, um, sorry if this cultural reference doesn't work for some of you, but most of us at the moment are living in Barbie world, okay? So in Barbie world, when we do our warnings, we, we create great science models, we create kind of great warnings, we send it out, people get the warning, they move just out of time, you know, the sort of, it's like those views in Venice where the, the boats can pass and people lift their, their feet up from the water coming in. That's sort of Barbie world of early warning. I think the real world, 
has differing strengths of institutions. The real world doesn't have multi-hazard early warning systems, even if we want them. The real world doesn't have enough funding, even if we want it. The real world doesn't have... It might have someone who's really great at doing their job and the next day they go off to work for another organisation because it's slightly better for them and their family. So I think what we're really trying to do with this, with this work in fragile conflict, violence affected states is be able to articulate a lot more of the nuance that there is. So it's brilliant for experts or people who know or have researched to write guidance and handbooks. If you knew what I knew, knew this is what you would do. But it's, it's largely pointless if step number three says, here's an impossible task for you, whatever that impossible task might be. For example, to, to, you know, one guidance I've read recently, to arrange a multi, to, you know, arrange a early warning system, first you need to have legislation in place that supports agencies working together. Like, wow, you know, even in countries like the UK, and I see colleagues from the Cabinet Office here who manage UK legislation on this, it's, it's really hard. So one of the things that we're doing is we're, we're accidentally putting these kind of tripwires in the way of everyone. So I think by looking at these fragile conflict-affected places, we will be able to articulate a lot better the nuance. And so we can talk about where people are now and where they might want to go. So we can talk about the sort of the now and the not yet. And you'll see, I think, some really cool work coming out of the Climate Centre, again, talking about these kind of climate action journeys, or talking about how um, organisations can move from one place to another as they develop capacity. And I think that's really what we want to do. Some of the particular problems we're looking at in fragile uh, places are, you know, strength of institutions, um, who provides the warning. It's not always going to be the people we ideally want to work with. It's quite a challenge for Laurie and I's organisation, UNDRR, which, which often has its main stakeholders as sovereign governments. Sometimes they're not able to, for whatever reason, maybe they're split in part, apart, they're you know, directly at conflict or whatever. So I think these nuances is where the important work lies, and it's for two reasons. One, when we get it wrong and put these tripwires in and people fall over them, we don't get warning systems. They just, they just don't work. And that's not just in the fragile places, it's everywhere. And number two, if we as these kind of you know, experts from the global north create this demand for ourselves that keeps us in kind of you know, perpetuating this, then no one's going to take these ideas and run with them themselves. And so I think the more prescriptive that we are about what you need to do, the less agency we give to those who are reading what they need to do, and the less scope they have to figure it out for their own context. And, and the great thing about that is that if people are able to figure it out in their own context, what comes back to us are questions that they need answering rather than things that we just want to tell them. And so I think we're really excited. And so um, what we're trying to do is we're developing this handbook on early warning and fragile context. And rather than maybe a normal handbook, which will tell you how to do everything, we're going to try and paint this picture of the kind of almost the most extreme versions of what's working sort of right now and where you might get to to get it better. Because I think unless we live in real world rather than sort of Barbie world, and we're not going to have the impact that we would like. Great. Uh, thanks very much. And indeed, this, this is, uh, follows up some other work that the, early, um, that the Center for uh, Climate and Disaster Resilience has carried out called Moving Back from the Edge, which is very much promoting early warning as one of the types of interventions that investment should focus on in countries. Because as we know, one of the big challenges in fragile contexts is the lack of climate investment that's going there. So this idea that obviously you don't try to promote a one-size-fits-all approach in countries, in any case, but certainly not in fragile contexts, but really to demonstrate that there are different types of approaches that can be successful in fragile contexts, in countries that are affected by conflict, and that merit investment, even if it's not the traditional model, is a message we really hope to, to convey. So thanks very much for that, John. Um, and I'd now like to go back to Vanessa. Now, Vanessa, as we've mentioned several times, you are the lead of Pillar 3. Um, but one of the things that um, kind of is the basis of the whole Early Warnings for All initiative and, and picks up to what John was just saying right now is that 
how are we really going to ensure that we reach the last mile or that countries themselves reach the last mile? And how can we avoid a situation where some people receive early warnings and are able to take action, but others are simply left behind? So what kinds of strategies do you see developing on this? Thank you very much. Um, first of all, just before I uh, get to that, I just wanted to mention again, we have so many examples today also of things that happen, and often we don't actually hear about them very much. And I think you mentioned also we have a lot of ways of communicating and exchanging information. But there, there is, I think, a bit of um, a challenge to sort of identify um, key things that work or key things that have to be in place, depending on the countries, of, for, of course. And that's why just I think the Early Warning for All initiative is a really good opportunity to make sure that we have you know, some basic sort of things in place. And we've developed this checklist just wanted to mention that, that, you know, sort of very key basic requirements, things that um, governments, different stakeholders can work on together. Um, again, this checklist is really the idea that all the pillars, the different parts of the early warning system value chain come together and um, that we work on. In terms of the, the success um, factors or how can we make sure that um, you know, people last mile gets, um, we have last mile communication and people get reached. I think um, one of the important things is that we need to understand the communities and that is something we can only do at the country level. We had a discussion earlier also with Lisa that when we go to countries and um, countries set up early warning systems, the first thing they need to know is what are the, the risk areas where are people, where do people work, because it's not just about where people live, but where are people during the day, for example, are those areas where we can reach them with a mobile phone. If that's not the case, then we need to look into alternative communication channels, sirens, um, other ways. So it's really, and I think we're missing that a lot in, a, um, in countries is, you know, what are, the, what are the different channels, what are the different ways we can reach communities, how many people listen to the radio, at what time of the day, uh, what you mentioned, you know, can people, when they sleep at night, what is, how can we reach them then? And so these are the first, that's sort of the first step. And this assessment is actually in our Pillar 3 checklist. It's one of the first things we need to understand the countries. Um, and then I think, again, we, you know, we need to, we have a lot of knowledge. We, we talk about the things that work or that don't, but I think we really need to bring in the donor community. Um, and I actually don't see that many of those here at the conference. So I think it's something, you know, that's very important. And again, it's one of the things on the Early Warning for All initiative. We need to make this link to those who actually pay for the things that we are recommending, um, that countries need, that countries are asking for. And I think that's, uh, that's going to be very important also in terms of what, what is the cost and what is the benefit, what is the impact of the things we can um, invest in, and that's something I think we'll continue to work on. Thank you. Great. Okay, so you've heard, uh, colleagues, a, a wide a range of opinions on uh, various topics related to learning. Uh, before I go back to the panelists, let me come back to you. Would you like to um, ask any follow-up questions or offer your own perspectives? I see a colleague here, so please go ahead. I, one, and then two, and then let, let me know. If you can pass our last remaining microphone. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, my question was about the. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm Biesh. I'm doing my PhD <coughs> at the University of Worcester. Uh, my question was about early warning in fragile context. So, um, if we are thinking about fragile context, maybe war in a country that's in um, that's right now in the war or something. How do we even talk about? <coughs> disaster risk reduction at that situation because from my own experience when a country goes into a war or certain kind of conflict they kind of stop thinking about environmental side of anything and climate change disaster risk reduction goes away from their, um, their interest even so how how do we even talk about like 
Oh, you are in war, yes, of course, but now we really need to talk about disastrous reduction and early warnings. Like, that just doesn't happen, or maybe it happens, but from my experience, it didn't. So that's kind of like, I'm thinking it's a disconnection, with maybe, so I'm just thinking about that. Thanks. Great. It's a great question. Why don't, why don't we take that? Because I'm sure all of us have worked in crisis areas and we'll offer different perspectives. John, do you want to kick Yeah, up? so great question. The simple answer for me, but I'm a bit biased because it's what I really care about. It's, it's about vulnerability. And so actually those who are most vulnerable to most, you know, those most at risk to most hazards, whether it's a volcano or an earthquake or a flood, um, are generally the poorest, the most excluded. Um, those who are poorer than their neighbours. Um, and coming back to my question before about, you know, not that many people like me die in disasters like this. And so I think in, in, in conflict settings, yes, you might not necessarily be warning them against flood or fire, although that might be what, what really um, impacts them. But if you're focusing on people who are most vulnerable for whatever it is that the hazard or risk comes in, um, and intervening in terms of their vulnerability, so whether that's just providing them kind of safe passage or cash or shelter or basic kind of humanitarian needs, you are by definition reducing their risk. So I think it's a bit of like a reframing of what disaster risk reduction is. And I think the critical thing we need to do for that is kind of remove the hazard bias from us. You know, a lot of us get into this because we're excited about volcanoes or earthquakes or floods, or we get really passionate about it. When we remove the hazard bias, we see people and those people at risk, mostly because they're poor. Yes, I would add to that also that perhaps it's a bit of reframing of what humanitarian communication and information is. And just as um, a number of us over the years have, have worked with the humanitarian agencies to encourage them to integrate um, information and communication within their services to communities, including in conflict zones, we are now encouraging them to embed um, the provision of weather forecasts and, and early warnings. And this is something we're, we're currently working on in the case of Sudan. So to, to consider these as, uh, as services, uh, critical information services that can be bundled into other information services that may be being provided by humanitarians or maybe being provided by community organizations or by those those media that still exist and and also taking advantage of the social media channels that that communities continue to use i mean those are two great answers and just to pick up with what john was saying i think sometimes the bias lies within the humanitarian sector itself um, and I can remember working in Afghanistan post 9-11, which was really a post-conflict setting. But during that time period, we had an earthquake in Badakhshan, floods in the Panjshir Valley. But the humanitarian and the political international community didn't want to hear anything about disaster risk reduction because they were very focused on the political stabilization in the country. And I think this focus uh, on vulnerability reduction resonates with them. They understand that. So I really appreciate John's answer on that. And that goes very much to the heart of this moving back from the EDGE report of the Center of Excellence, which is saying, you know, we have to move away from a hazard bias and really look at vulnerability and exposure as main components of increasing risk. And we know that vulnerability is compounded in fragile context. So that's the type of work that we're trying to do at DRR, UNDRR with co uh, colleagues um, and in the Red Cross and others. But that was a great question. So thank you very much. Let me see if there are other, yes, there was a colleague in the back as well. Hello. Okay. So I'm Caroline Bain, I'm from the UK Met Office. Um, I'm really interested, some of the things that you've mentioned already, and of course, you know, you're preaching to the choir here, is, is around sort of co-production and getting users involved in actually really thinking about how those warnings are being communicated, what's successful, how they're being presented. That's great. We all love that. The problem is also is the scaling of that as well. So one of the things, I guess my question is really around, one is the scaling. How do you scale that? Because you can't have conversations with everybody in the country. Um, and every community. Um, and then also standards. So whilst it's really important that like individual states and individual countries have their own way of communicating things, there is still... Oh, 
well. Sorry, that would be the end of it. Um, there's, there's still a need for some sort of international standard so that we have at least something that we can agree on is roughly something that is familiar and is, is kind of good across the world that we, you know, we think is good. And then finally, I guess, um, is, is the sustainability of that. So it's kind of the, the scale, the sustainability of that and the standards of that. but we want to follow that up it's not like job done we finish now you know we want to continually improve the, the products and services that we provide them with so I'm interested in how you're going to get to that audience. great question the three S's scale standards and I think probably the most important is sustainability and I think with early warnings for all the last thing we want is a time limited initiative that after five years peters out and there's no sustainability in the countries. But maybe I'll go to Ben with this one. Um, this is your business at REAP. So tell us, scale structure, uh, I can't read my handwriting, scale standards and sustainability. Over to you. Thanks, Laurie, and thanks for the question. So um, I'm aware there are others in this room as well who would be able to add a lot on this. But from my perspective, um, it's about all of these areas working in concert. So you're right, we can't design everything up with every individual in a country and go completely, um, you know, entirely bottom up throughout the whole system. But um, what Vanessa was talking about in terms of where the mobile network operators have a role to play in terms of um, getting messages out to the biggest number of people possible and then working with the local community uh, groups, you know, civil society organisations, to be able to contextualize that. We've got working groups within the partnership who are looking at effective risk communications and what are we learning from different parts of the world? What can be replicated? What can be scaled? Um, so we need you know, the legislation, we need the big infrastructure in place at the national level, but it has to be contextualized. We've heard over and over again that language is really important. What people understand and the trust in the systems and so on, all of it has to be contextualized, otherwise it doesn't reach. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a work in progress, but everybody has to be able to play their role effectively for us to move to scale. In terms of the standards, just to give a plug for a session later in the week, we're, uh, as a partnership, we're working on a paper around state versus non-state actors um, and the roles and responsibilities. There are different areas where different types of actor have... Um, added value you know so where is it that the private sector can really add value where is it that the state has to play the leadership role where is it that civil society can have their role to play in this whole value chain so I think we've still got more work to do in terms of those clear roles and responsibilities areas of added value it's not going to be the same you know the world over but what are the the applicable lessons what are the um, the standards, the principles that can be adopted and, and rolled out more widely. And then in terms of sustainability, just a couple of thoughts. Mami Mizutori mentioned this morning, this has to be a whole of society approach. Um, so I think it's important, as mentioned, that all these different layers are working in concert together, um, but each one is as important as the other. It might be sequential, you know, there might have to be... Um, investments in certain areas first before you can move on to the next stage but each of them is equally as important if we're really serious about that delivery um, at community level so i think yeah investment across the chain and really seeing the the local communities and the governments as the key stakeholders who have that responsibility for their citizens going forward it's not the international agencies it's the governments who have uh, that mandated responsibility so that's where the investments have to go ultimately thanks and again as i i find the issue of sustainability so important especially since we're making such a big push with donors and with multilateral banks others to really um, invest in early warning systems let me just see if other panelists would like to reflect on how can we ensure this is sustainable it's a, a really key question. Um, one could make the case that if actually a service is really valued by a local community, they'll find a way of paying for it. And that's exactly what our partners are doing in Nairobi, the local relay service by SMS with information put, translated into Sheng, the local patois. That's paid for locally and, and the community cleanups in advance of storms by a, a car wash service. So they, they have found a way of 
um, actually making a particular part of the, the chain mm -hmm. sustainable. I, 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 I do think, however, that there is part of sustainability is, is just ownership, internalizing it within the system, but also costing cost benefit analysis of actually what's you know what um, what has been saved, what loss and damage has been avoided. And so I think mm -hmm. we do need to bring the economists in here so that actually for early warnings for all to have an afterlife and an after afterlife, we will need hard hard figures and need to look at methodologies like the counterfactual, the community that didn't get the warnings, all these issues. So yeah, that's all part of sustainability. So the metrics, the economics, but the 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 ownership inside the system and then lastly pieces of it being paid by the communities that get the value. Great answers. Okay, perfect. So, and then just a uh, comment on standards. Yeah. Just one um, one point. So, as part of the pillar three on warning dissemination and communication, one of the important sub pillars is on the common alerting protocol CAP, um, which is a international standard. It's an ITU standard. Um, it's not about um, any particular communication channels for all communication channels, but it's about the format of the, the message, the alert. So what is what is happening? What is the action people are supposed to take? Um, what Which area is affected? And it's to make sure that, for example, between the Met offices and the, um, the disaster management agency, there is a standard way of communicating to make sure, because especially for Met agencies, I think very often complica uh, messages would be complicated for normal Normal people for not people haven't um, you know who are not working in med offices and then also to relay this message from the disaster management agencies to the different communities um, so this cap uh, common alerting protocol and by the way something WMO IFRC and ITU we have this call to action for uh, on cap so that's a very important um, component of, of our work okay and then uh, quickly to John and Zoe and then we'll wrap up <laughs> Um, great. Yeah, I, I wanted to go back for a moment to the sustainability question because I, I think that it, it really is key and ties to the theme of the session of, of learning and how do we make sure that we're sustaining systems and continuing to, to iterate and, and to learn. Recently I was in, in Sri Lanka with Dialogue Axiata to understand how their early warning system has developed over time. It was created in 2004 following the tsunami there and there was great urgency and energy following that because of the great devastation that Sri Lanka um, suffered. It was a collaboration between the University of Moratua, Oxiata, the mobile network operator there, and the government. And, and one of the challenges that they've talked about is the sustainability over time because as different administrations have come in and out of power, um, as financing has changed in the beginning, it was the mobile network operator who really created the system and paid for it, but 20 years on, it's hard for the company to, to maintain that, that system. Um, and I think uh, the combination of, of local ownership, as, as Mark said, and also financial support from the international community, because you know Sri Lanka is facing multiple challenges. And, and it's hard both at the political level to, to maintain the focus on, on disasters that, that thankfully don't happen every single year on the scale of the 2004 tsunami. Um, but also in terms of people and awareness, in terms of their day-to-day -day priorities. How do you make sure that people are still aware of the risks and, and we're maintaining that? And, and I think it's a challenge and I think the initiative, the Early Warning for All initiative can help in sort of refocusing and helping countries to, to finance uh, sustainable long-term systems. Great, thanks. So John? Twenty seconds. <laughs> 20 seconds. Okay, so there's some great stuff I think out there in the kind of citizen science community-based right. early warning literature and guidance that might answer a few of your questions. But for me, maybe it's about a couple of things, a couple of like big reversals. So it's about kind of thinking about the last and putting them first in everything we do. Okay, and then after that, and that's you know this like power reversal. And then after that, really, I get I get it. You can't go to every community, can't listen to every single person, but are we really focusing on representation and fairness? Okay, so are these voices and needs and rights represented in what we're doing? If not, we need to think about it. And secondly, is that representation fair? So we can't expect everyone all the time, but it's why it's really great that, you know, like the partnership that Ben represents has hundreds, if not thousands of organizations. Again, Mark also, a lot of us, you know, we, we represent those kind of things or try our best to. 
Since you have the microphone, keep it. And with one sentence, very quickly, what is the most effective approach, or what could we do better to integrate early warning in, to integrate learning into early warning systems? And you might want to be focused on the early warning for all initiatives in particular. What should we be doing that we're not doing now? For either early warning systems or the initiative? I think we need to reimagine the status quo. We need to rethink what we're already thinking. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll address the early warning systems piece. Um, Zoe mentioned information ecosystems. I, I think when we approach um, early warning, we, we need to let go of this idea of first mile, last mile, linear information, whilst really embracing the opportunity of cell broadcasting. But understand this is about harnessing complex dynamic information systems just like natural systems where information is not static it changes and it's part of the public sphere so it's also about the theory of the public sphere and as we all know when we issue our children a warning often it's not listened to but actually we have a dialogue with them if we understand the dynamics of dialogue right including public dialogue we will get a lot further so yes embrace the opportunity of cell broadcasting and technology and, and its efficiency, but let's embed that within, as Vanessa mentioned, a multi-channel environment that's tethered in theories of information ecosystems and the public sphere. Yes, great. So, in one sentence, sorry. <laughs> what, what can we do better to embed learning into early warning systems? And if you want to reflect on the initiative as well, that would be welcome. One sentence. One sentence is, is a challenge, but I, I would say there's a few. There's localization, which has come up a lot today, inclusivity, accountability, cross-sector collaboration, and strong preparedness. Wonderful. Thank you. So, Vanessa, same question to you. All the important things have been said. No. I, said, I would say learn together and bring all the stakeholders together, especially for the early warning. I think the importance of relationships between the different pillars are really important. And I think the more that we can do that, and I was really encouraged this morning to hear that, I think that sounds really exciting. And I think there's a lot of opportunities to take what's already been done and go forward from that. Maybe just to build on that point then, I think we need to take off our institutional hats or would it, whatever bit we're working on, let's try and imagine what it looks like from other bits because otherwise we won't know and we'll stick to our little areas of expertise. Wonderful. Well, we, only ha we actually have no more time left. Um, but thank you all very much. And I was really glad, glad to get your questions and wish we had more time to reflect. Um, but I really hope that we will be able to work together to embed more learning, including with partnerships with, for example, the Warning Center here at UCL and between academia and practitioners and we really make sure that uh, we are learning together and from each other. So thank you all very much. Thank you for Karina for offering us this opportunity and enjoy the rest of the, the sessions. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure that there was a lot of information relayed in this session. So if you're wanting to stay for just a few extra minutes, Lorna's gonna take you through her graphical representation of the session, which will hopefully highlight some summary points. Um, all right, so I was, uh, drawing, <laughs> I was drawing along the discussion um, and uh, since now you can't see, I have to describe it to you. But uh, on the top, I had uh, three boxes for the different videos that we've seen. And I'm going to quickly zoom in. And there's the one on the um, Our Valley flood um, with uh, people not being reached by the warnings. Oh, this is very disappointing. No, this, is, this seems to be working. This is... It always tells me, and I can see it here. Okay, there we go. Try that. Okay. Um, so with the Ah Valley flood and people not being uh, reached and uh, the sirens that are now being uh, reinstalled, then the wildfires in California, again, also as something that happened at night and uh, how alerting everybody at the same time might clog the streets. Um, and then the um, earthquake and the, um, uh, the, the situation in Indonesia, um, also with uh, understanding what is actually an effective warning for this area and then communication also via social media or WhatsApp or other uh, different channels. And here I've just put down some of the things that, I mean, it has been a lot said in this discussion. I'm going to zoom in into uh, a few things that have been, um, that sounded very like 
like they've been said many times, for example, the use of mobile technology um, with targeting the right people, which can, uh, which is important to keep the most vulnerable in mind, but also um, the different warning systems that actually wake people up in the night, um, geofencing, and the different uh, opportunities there. Then also it has been said it's not unprecedented, but this has not happened to me yet. There's someone like, paddling through the, the uh, a flooded area. Um, then uh, what anticipate end that's a difficult word anticipatory action actually can be done and what people should be uh, what they should know to do um, this might actually not be so clear to them um, honesty has been said then here this is uh, about sharing like the, the, the chocolate the information to work together successfully which might not always feel so good but in the end it's uh, like a good thing to do. And uh, I'm just going to add two points here, the legible design with using all the, all the data, then designing for local barriers or local uh, situations, what kind of technology are people using, which languages are they actually speaking, um, and hereby uh, considering the locals and not have, um, I just added this, this uh, the image that has already been um, mentioned with the tripping wires, uh, with the privilege uh, that some people um, yeah, might be uh, forgotten when you're just looking with your own like, glasses at this. And I think I'll leave it at this. <laughs> She's amazing, isn't she? Thank you, Lorna. Um, these will be available afterwards as well for you to use and distribute, so that's wonderful. Thank you, panel. Uh, thank you so much, Laurie, for, for heading that up. Thank you for joining us today. Again, we really appreciate your time. Thank you, all the panellists. We now have our evening reception, so please do um, help yourself to wine and nibbles. But I think Mark wants to say something. Yes. Could I do a quick pro promo plug, <laughs> film premiere tomorrow at five? Is it here or in another, another room? Uh, it's an eight-minute film um, made by a, uh, a filmmaker based in an informal settlement in Nairobi, uh, looking at uh, an early warning system that we co-created with the residents. We have a fantastic panel, so do come along five tomorrow for the premiere. And thank you to our online audiences uh, for joining us today. Um, we hope that you've uh, had the opportunity to get some of your questions asked. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of questions and discussion. Um, but thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Thank you very much, everyone online. Have a good evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are, and speak soon. Thank you.